Hello, how are you doing? I'm Craig Parkinson. You are listening to the Two Shot Podcast. Sit yourself down, pop the kettle on. We're going to have a nice old chat. Who's it with this week? I'm going to tell you right now. <laughs> It's episode 34 of the Two Shot Podcast, and this week we go to London to meet a Welsh woman. She's called Lisa Palfrey. It's a fantastic episode. More of that in a sec. Now, I'm not going to waffle on this week. All I want to say is a couple of things, right? I want to say a huge thank you to Kevin Proctor. Now, as you all know, we're an independent podcast. We travel around, sometimes to people's homes, sometimes to people's offices. And this time we went to London, myself and producer Griff. We didn't have anywhere to record, but we had guests lined up. And Kevin Proctor reached out and said, you know what? I've got a Soho office. It's all yours. Go for it. So thank you, Kevin. I don't know what we would have done without you. Now, this is episode 34. It's with Lisa Palfrey. Now, you might think, I'm not... I know that face. Where do I know her from? Now, you might know her from the brilliant film Pride with past Two Shot guest Joseph Gilgan. If you haven't seen it, do go and check it out. You may have seen her recently on the stage in London's West End in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof. But of course, this being the Two Shot podcast, we don't really talk about that. We get down to the more important stuff, which you'll hear in a sec. Also, 19th of May... Get your Dice FM app. Tickets are going fast for Dave Haslam and Paddy Considine. Please come join us. It's going to be a belter. Another belter is this. It's episode 34 of the Two Shot Podcast with Lisa Palfrey. Have you had this lurgy? No. No, I've, got, I've been all right with it. Don't get it. Have you had it? Fucking hell, yeah. For how long? Um, initially for like four or five weeks, then it decides to come back for a bit and then go away again. Did not you on your ass? Yeah, some people have had like two and a half months. It's really nice. I wouldn't <laughs> I, recommend it. I highly recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> so I had a dream last night and I woke up at four o'clock in the morning and it was a... I never had this before in my life. It was a podcast anxiety dream. <laughs> I, I was in this room... I was in this room with Griff and I'd never been in there before when we were conducting a conducting a podcast. Sounds so official, doesn't it? We were doing a podcast. Um, and the guy who was on was just being really odd and really weird. Every, every question I asked him, he'd go, yeah, no, no. And I said, so what about, what about your mum? <laughs> well, I don't think, this, I'm not going to talk about that. And just went off and then stormed out. And then I woke up. Maybe I'll do that. No, I don't think you will. But do you, <laughs> know, you, you, know, as, you know, when you're actors, you have those anxiety dreams. Yeah. Do you, do you get those? Yeah, that, those ones when you're on stage and you're not in the play and they go, you're on. But I'm not in the play. <laughs> yeah, you are in the play. I'm not. Do you never get them before filming? Yeah. Do you? Sometimes. But just you don't... And it never gets to that bit in the dream where you've actually got to do it. But it's all the bit before. And the heart racing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you swear on this? We can say anything we want. Great. That's why I got you on. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only reason I got you on, Lisa. Do you know what? If you look at my phone, it says names. Under you, it says Lisa Bloody Palfrey. Is it? It's true. It's true. <laughs> when I bumped into you last year and I went, oh, it's Lisa Bloody Palfrey. And that's how I put you oh, in. And that's, that's how nice. you shall forever be known. Mm. Tell me about uh, Wales. Tell, tell, about tell Wales. me about growing up in Wales. Oh, where shall I start? Um, at the very beginning. At the very beginning. I grew up in a little village called Groiswen, which probably had about 12 houses. And my parents... Whereabouts is that in relation? It's kind of between Cardiff and Caerphilly. Right. Um, and it's a really old little village. And we were quite poor, but my parents were quite sort of um, academic. What do your parents do for a living? My... Dad was a lecturer, a teacher, then a lecturer. In what? Um, I th- that's a really good question. <laughs> I think he lectured in um, 
um, sociology. Right. Um, so he's Dr. Colin Palfrey. Is he? Yeah, he's a doctor. Um, and then he retired and became like a spin doctor for Plaid Cymru in the Welsh Assembly, like a, a script writer. Really? Yeah, and then he's retired now and he hates it. He absolutely hates being retired. And my mum was a teacher, and then she became an actress and a presenter, and they both write. Um, so, yeah, they, they, my mum just doesn't stop working. She doesn't stop. Is that because she, she, she doesn't want to? No, she doesn't want to. She's very much like your dad, she doesn't want to sit still. Yeah, they're both like that. I, on the other hand, love sitting still. Do you? <laughs> I would win medals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, my sister's like it. But... So is it just you and your sister? No, and i got a, a younger brother as well. And how is that in the house? We all get on very well growing up. Yeah, we, yeah, me and my sister argued every morning over knickers and socks, because there's only two years between us. Did you share the, the same room? My, no. No, but my mum would stupidly buy us the same knickers and socks. So um, that was like the morning thing. And the only, the only way we'd stop is my mother would shout out, I put sugar on the Weetabix and then that'd be it. <laughs> or milk, milk on the Weetabix. So then we'd come running downstairs. Mm. And what's the age difference between you so and your years. sister? She's two years older, but my brother's seven years younger. So we never really argued because he was like our baby. Yeah, yeah. we were very protective of him. Yeah, yeah, and he's the same now he's grown up, you know. We're, we're three of us are really close. But both my parents are remarried, so I've got a brother and a sister, a stepbrother and sister, and a half-brother and sister, just because I've got the full three sets Gosh, just so showing off. quite a big extended family yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. And when did you... Do you mind me asking you about when your mum and dad decided to...? Yeah, they split up um, when I was about ten, and... Um, it got announced on Boxing Day, which was nice. It was a happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. Yeah, so... I, um, I, I mean, <laughs> on, what, what? It was just like an extra gift, you know. It was like we hadn't had enough things for Christmas, <laughs> so they gave us that too. Um, yeah, my dad had made a meal, and it was a real sort of cold turkey, you know, sort of meal. And uh, we thanked our mum, and she said, well, that's your dad made that, and it's probably going to be the last meal he makes you, and... He's leaving, and yeah, very memorable day. Was this out of the blue, or did you...? I knew for a long time, but I didn't tell anyone, yeah. What, you could sense that it was going to happen? Yeah, I just kind of knew. It was, he was um, seeing someone else. Oh, crikey. Mm. I used to follow him to um, the phone box near the pub when our phone was working and think, that's not right. But I didn't tell anyone, because, you know... You're not going to tell your sister? I didn't tell anyone. Wow. I've written about it quite a lot. Have you? Yeah, I did a short film about it called Pineapple Girl, which is kind of about that. She's all right. You hear, was it a little girl being this sort of detective figure? Yeah, because my, my daughter was born on Christmas Day, so it's about your parents telling you you're special all the time because you're born on Christmas Day. But this actually is a true story. My dad dressed up as Father Christmas in a chapel vestry party when I was about six. Right. And... Um, my friend noticed his purple flares under the costume and said it was my dad. But for about a day or two, I thought my dad was Father Christmas. Yeah, I That's know. <laughs> so, so nice for such a small amount yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah. But it's about that thing when, when you're going through an awful time in your life, your parents tell you how special you are, and you, it turns out, it turns out that it's because it's shit. <laughs> but you know what? I'm over it. So when your dad left, but I'm talking about this. You're no, right, no, 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 no. Um, what was the, what was, how did the dynamic shift within the family? Was everything, how did, because your brother being seven years younger. Yeah, my brother was three. And I remember him saying to my mum that um, he was the little man now. It was quite heartbreaking. God, that <laughs> it's is. really a... sad. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, but we were very, very close. Me and my mum and my sister... Um, Do you think it made you even closer? Yeah, yeah, I think it really, really did, yeah. Um, but, you know, I'm really close to my dad now as well, so everything's good. Did that take time to become yeah, close? Yeah, a little bit of time, yeah, I think so. Yeah. But it's sort of, I think as a kid, you're really resilient to all those things. Yeah. And I think it's only when you, um, when you start having relationships yourself that it kind of affects you. Like trust and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But um, you know, therapy's good. 
Therapy is good. <laughs> too Highly true. Recommended. Too true, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> School time for you. What was that like? Were you as academic? Because you said that your, even though your mum and dad obviously sounded very creative, they yeah. sounded very high up in the academics as well. Yeah, I um, I wasn't a fan of school really. I was, <laughs> I was bored a lot of the time. I was very naughty. Um, if I wasn't interested in something, I just wouldn't try really. I found a lot of it really easy. Um, you just be asked. So I got quite bored. I was reading when I was about three, so I would be put in a corner on my own while every, all the kids were learning to read with a, with a boring book. They weren't very good at bright kids in Caerphilly. <laughs> they didn't really know what to do with them. And then they gave me this IQ test when I was about seven, and it was quite high, but they didn't, um, they didn't actually speed up my, my learning at all. So I was just bored a lot of the time. Yeah, I bet. So by the time I went to high school, I was mainly standing outside the classroom for being naughty. Were you... How did you respond with authority? <laughs> I'm terrible with authority. Really, Lisa? I really... Yes. <laughs> I just... I don't get it. I don't like it. It really brings my heckles up. I find most rules are banal and... Um, I really don't like to be told what to do or how to behave because I behave very well and I'm you do, you do. very respectful of others. This is true. But, um, yeah, I have an issue with them um, with being told what to do. I sometimes I was talking to somebody as well with, about um, uh, authority problems and, and they said to me, you know, I'm, I'm totally fine normally, but it's when somebody who doesn't know as much as I do then that's when I have a problem because yeah. you're, you're trying to tell me something that I've got a, a far greater knowledge of. Absolutely. And that just drives me yeah, insane. Yeah, yeah. I'm becoming far more cantankerous as I get older as well, just with my, um, I don't know, just like my tolerance of people. Not people, but what people do. In what respect? In that... In, like, in the working environment or just in just life? Just like walking around London, I'm the mad woman now who talks while I walk and says dickhead to, to people because... Oh, it's, oh it was you! <laughs> <to me. laughs> yeah, like entitlement. People with a sense of entitlement I can't bear, you know, yeah. if you're in a bar or a club or somewhere and they just... People who have, have no sensibility of how their actions might affect other people. Gets my goats. That happens all the time, though, doesn't it? All the time. And I, yeah, I, I try to be more tolerant. The only way I deal with that on a bus, if somebody, you know, plays loud music or something, I just say thank you for sharing. Yeah, you kill them with kindness. <laughs> yeah. They're gobsmacked. They don't know Sometimes what to do. they turn it off. Do they? Yeah, I say it with a big smile. Thank you for sharing. Like, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise they might have a knife. I don't know. <laughs> It's true, you do have to be careful mm. nowadays, don't you? You don't know who you're talking to. Yeah. So, back to school, Bryn High School. Were you at the same school as your sister? I was in the same school as my sister, yeah. And she was very protective of me in school. Was she very much, did she, was she very much like you? No. Um, <laughs> my, I, was, I was quite a good girl in the first year. I went to an all Welsh school, so all, all my lessons were in Welsh. Right. Um, and I spoke Welsh at home. My mum is a Welsh speaker, um, and my dad had learnt Welsh, and I also spoke English. But they punished you in high school if you were caught speaking English, which is banal and wrong, um, and it just made me want to speak English all the time. Because, Did it? Well, yeah, because, again, way. someone telling me what to do. Um, but for a while I spoke Welsh when I was about 11, and I got there, and my sister just thought I was the lamest, swatty... <laughs> Horrible <laughs> little sister in the world. Um, and she was quite a rebel in school. And then um, there was a very strict <laughs> school uniform. And my mother had bought the wrong style of T-shirt to wear under our woolen stripy dress. And they made me change into a big thick jumper. And my, it was a really hot day and my sister found out and went fucking ballistic with the teacher. And um, she ended up being... Um, thrown out of the sixth form block for being cheeky to them and everything but yeah she was my hero it was like she stood up for me and you know they gave me my t-shirt back 
That's amazing. Are you still, are you still dead close now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, amazing. Yeah, the three of us are, yeah. So at this all, what was the name of this all Welsh school? It was called Ysgol Gyfyn Rhydfelen. Say that again, please. Ysgol Gyfyn Rhydfelen. Love it. Yeah. And it's very notorious. They've actually bulldozed it now. Uh, very notorious for a very famous paedophile drama teacher. I take it back. I don't yeah. love it. It was, just, it was just you speaking Welsh that I loved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, you know, that was that as well. So, um, so when did that all come to light? That all came to light when we were all grown up. And um, he'd been sort of grooming kids for about 20 years. Yeah. Did this come as something that was a shock to you, or was no. it something that was well known? It, even as a kid, you knew that he was the most frightening man. Everyone was petrified of him. Talking about dreams, I used to have nightmares about him for years and years and years after leaving school. And yeah, he, you know, from raping boys to just, you know, sort of fondling you or whatever. Oh I mean, in God. school, off the premises. He ended up killing himself. Um, before the trial, but um, so that that was my school. Thank God they've bulldozed that down. Yeah, that's been bulldozed. Going Good away from religions. school slightly. <laughs> <laughs> Such a happy childhood. <laughs> we can laugh now. <laughs> so when did <coughs> when did sort of the acting and the drama come in? Because we you, were you doing that at that school. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of known as the Welsh School of Fame. That that, that very drama teacher was, was a very talented teacher and director and writer. Um, there is, of course, I don't know if you've heard of the Esteddfod, which is the big Welsh festival every year. I have heard of it. Yes. Celebrates all singing, all dancing, all acting. You know. Did you, did you do that? Um, I did very briefly as a very young kid. Um, not your bag. Reciting, but again, not really my bag. Again, was it all in Welsh? All in Welsh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I was quite a shy kid in that um, I didn't like getting up and performing. Um, when my grandmother, when I would stay with my grandmother and she'd have friends round, she'd ask me to sing or recite and I used to hate it. Um, until one day I'd learnt a poem that was in English because my English wasn't that great when I was about six, five or six. And it, I'd learnt it from my mother's rag mag and it went... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to get her poor dog a bone and when she bent over, over went Rover and gave her a bone of his own. <laughs> so I recited that not knowing what it meant. And, um, that was like something... She never it, asked again. <laughs> <laughs> I would have definitely asked again. That's why I got my history. Yeah. My li- my little boy was doing something uh, as a presentation in his school for the- he was only six for the first time. But he yeah. was- and he was being Samuel Pepys. Oh. And he did all this posh voice. He said, "I've got to do a posh voice." I said, "All right, okay, go on." <laughs> Working at all these things, I'm going. Jesus Christ, he's going to be a fucking actor. And uh, now it was so funny in it and so good that when people were coming around the other week, I was going, "Do you Samuel Pepys?" He went. No, stop doing it. But I think it's ter- terrible yeah, for a parent to do that to a kid. I like, really no, caught myself on and went, don't, don't, do, do, don't do that. Don't be one of those. Because <laughs> of course they don't want to no, be know. some sort But some of... kids do, don't they? Some kids are all singing, all dancing, all, you know. I wasn't. I was very, very shy to do all that. I think but, that's very um, natural, though, to be that shy. Yeah, I yeah. I think that sometimes, and forgive me if any listeners have children like that, I'm sure they're lovely. But... <laughs> It can, you know, it was borderline precocious. It's a bit precocious, isn't it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and I've yeah. always been brought up not to really be like that. Yeah, yeah. No, so, not my bag. When you left high school? Yeah. Did you go sixth form? Sixth form was part of the high... No, I went to another high school because the family moved. My mother got remarried and had been remarried for quite some time. And they bought a bigger house and I moved out of the sort of area. So I had to go to... Like the rival high school, a school given San Harry, which was <laughs> weird because we were like sworn enemies. But I had a great time there because oh, they'd only known me since I was 16. So I kind of got treated a little differently and I had a bit more swagger. And um, used to use, and we had a lovely, it was a new school, so it was a big sort of six form block and like our own toilets and everything and that was called our office and that's where we used to smoke dope 
Of course, you're 16. Yeah. You're, you're, you're grown up <laughs> now. You need your office. You need your office space yeah, to smoke, yeah. smoke your dough. Yeah, so people used to come in and apologise for using the toilets. It was like, fine. <laughs> <laughs> So that was much better. That what, was, were you do, what, what were you studying at Sixth Form? I did um, A-levels in English drama... No, not drama. English history and Welsh. Yeah. Was drama not on the... No, it film? wasn't an A-level then. No, I would have done it otherwise. Were you doing anything extracurricular? I was doing, like... Uh, there was, like, a Welsh-language drama company. They used to pick kids from all over Wales... And we did Romeo and Juliet one year, and then I got the lead role in Pinocchio. Did you? Yeah, 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 babe, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Happy memories. Yeah. Being a wooden child. Lovely, <laughs> lovely. My happiest memory was a child shouting out, Pinocchio's got tits, which was quite nice. <laughs> yeah, so heckling, heckling. And, yeah, and then I went to um, a Welsh university and did drama in Welsh. Oh, you did drama in Welsh at yeah, uni? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And did you, even at sixth form, were you thinking, this is going to be a career for me, or certainly this is what I wanted to attempt? I knew from about the age of nine that I was going to be an actress. Really? Yeah. What okay. were you thinking at the age of nine? I just, I can't remember ever wanting to be anything else. It's really strange, isn't it? I can't remember. I know, I, I, I dabbled with being a clothes designer because that sounded glamorous. But um, that was always it. That was always what I wanted to do. Were you I, looking up to, were you sort of watching the telly or thinking of, oh, that's who I want to be like, that's who I want to portray, things like that, characters like that? Or? Yeah, I was, but I was far more interested in adverts when I was a kid. I used to watch boring films so I could watch the adverts. Adverts were good, though. Adverts were so adverts brilliant. Adverts used to be brilliant. Where's mate? all the jingles gone, babe? I don't know. Someone needs to get on that. No one does songs anymore. I know so many songs. I'm not going to sing them now. But that, but right, yes. We'll do that as a podcast special. Yeah, we'll do at least as advert <laughs> jingles. Um, but yeah, I guess... My, cause my mum was an actress when I was... Well, she, she started acting when I must have been about... I don't know, about six or seven. And she used to do this, like, kids' telly programme, like, this really funny programme. And I remember going in with her and my sister in my new Marks and Spencer sandals, you know, all dressed up, and watching them record it and think, why does she want to come home to us? I was just thinking how amazing she was that she'd do this and then want to come home. And I think, wow, it was just, yeah. And was it in Welsh? Yeah, it was in Welsh, yeah. What was yeah. it called? It's called Telephant. Like Elephant, but, but telly, Telephant. Because it's on the telly, isn't it? And did she do theatre as well? Mm hmm. Did you go and see her on stage? Yeah, yeah. Oh, you must have been so influenced by your mum. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But I think even before she started being an actress, I knew that's what I wanted to be. Really? Yeah, yeah. So, what age did she start to become an actress? Or decide that that's what she wanted to do? My mum? Yeah. I guess after teaching, after having my brother, and she'd always kind of dabbled through the Estevod and things like that. Yeah. And, um, you know, did look, sort of like poetry readings. And she's very, very funny, my mum. She's um, got a wicked sense of humour. And she's brilliant at performing, you know. And she's a real all-rounder. Yeah. And she is a writer and a producer and, you know, no stopping her. Um, and... She used to get, like, really confused with me when I turned stuff down I didn't want to do. I remember being asked to be, um, you know, one of these hostesses on um, on a Welsh quiz show, like the... I think they said the thinking man's crumpet, and I was like, nah. Oh. You can't fuck right off. <laughs> um, you know, and I remember her going, you can't turn things down. And I was like, well, I fucking can, because I just have, you know. That is healthy, though, I think. Yeah, it's the only control you have, isn't it? Exactly. So, yeah... To university. Mm. I didn't like that either. <laughs> oh, God. I was, you know what I was really hoping for then? Just a glimmer of light going, oh, Well, there is a glimmer of light, so I'll tell you why. Because I had the most amazing drama teacher. And her name was Emily Davis. And she was in her 60s then. And she probably became my best friend there. At university? Yeah, yeah. I had friends, but mm. she is the one person that really influenced me and saw something in me and drew it out. And, um, yeah, I have her to thank for a hell of a lot of stuff. 
um, and for my, I'd say, perseverance, I have her to thank for. So that was, without, without going there, I would never have met that amazing woman. Yeah. And what kind of stuff was she doing with you? Um, I remember you putting on production. Yeah, or? you know, we'd be doing Chekhov and Ibsen and Shakespeare and all the classics, but in Welsh. Um, I think, yeah. And you encouraged me to... I was in a director's course and encouraged me to just, you know, follow my gut and follow my instincts. And I directed Endgame and, you know, it was very wanky student and I based it all around Francis Bacon and all that. And But, you know, it just gave me that courage, I think, to listen to that little voice inside and, yeah. and go with it rather than, um, you know, perceive it as being a stupidity or something. Or something that you could do in your spare time. Well, yeah, yeah, you know. So she was a massive influence on me and one of the loveliest people I've ever known. So, but yeah, I didn't really like the students much, the Welsh students. They were a bit, they were a bit Nazi-ish. <laughs> <laughs> a bit conservative with a small C. So um, what about after university? Did you, um, did you contemplate going to drama school or...? Well, I, came, I went to go to... Um, auditions for drama school when I was 18 mm. and I came up to London and I was so green and so young I thought there is no way on God's earth I'm going to survive this place on my own at 18 and also the, you couldn't get grants you couldn't get grants to go there from Wales and my parents were nowhere near rich enough to send me no. so it was kind of a no-go really yeah um but as soon as I left college I had loads and loads of work lined up I started out being part of a double act called Dim Problem, which means no problem. Was this the what, like a sketch? Yeah, it's like on a youth show. I mean, this guy, Marion Davis, um, mm. told them that we were a double act when we were in college and we weren't just because we were lying and we wanted work. So, because S4C was still relatively young then and they were always looking for new, you know, new blood and stuff. Yeah. So I was doing that at the same time as I was doing a preschool programme called Bruchon, which translates into crumbs. And that is when <laughs> the breakfast food <laughs> comes to life when the kids leave for school. So I played a fried egg and a very aggressive cornflake. <laughs> An aggressive cornflake? <laughs> yes. Like a punk, sort of like a Toya Wilcox cornflake kind of thing. Which had a lot of complaints from parents, but it was like cult viewing with students. I still get recognised. I got recognised in Crystal Palace in a nightclub about a year ago as, as, as the fried egg. Yeah. What were the complaints from parents about? Oh, because the conflict was too angry. It was just, <laughs> just too much. Have you seen just your kids? How angry they are. Aggressive conflict. It was so much fun. It was so much fun. They'd wheeled out this old director of Coronation Street to direct them, and he was, you know, he wasn't on the ball. And the scripts would be about six minutes long, and they'd just, like, ask you to stretch them. And it was me and this guy who was an absolutely wonderful man called Edvil Ogwen Parry, and we would have the best fun. There was so many innuendos in it. Sometimes we'd openly corpse and they'd put it out on telly. And there's one episode where we find a handkerchief and we hide behind it, underneath it. And if you listen really carefully, you can actually hear me as the cornflake going, fuck it out. <laughs> you can hear it. And that went out to preschool children. So I've no idea why they complained, but there's <laughs> nothing wrong Please with that. Please tell me these clips are available to I find. I can't on find each. them. I really can't. They're on video somewhere. have got to try and dig those out, mm. That's, Hysterical. That's that's history. Yeah. Beautiful stuff. That was my first kind of breakdown when I was a, a beef burger, standing on licorice all sorts, and I thought, what am I doing in my life? And I just la laughed for about half an hour. I couldn't, I couldn't even get off the licorice all sorts. And everyone left the studio and just left me there. <laughs> so when I knew. A, a solitary tear <laughs> going down your little beef burger face. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, because you, you've been... How long have you been acting now, then? I've been acting for 32 years. So you must have seen so much change. Yeah. Yeah. What's, the, what's one of the main things that's, that's, that's affected you? 
Mm, that's an, that's that's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you know. The one thing I do notice is how wholesome young actors are and how clean living and well behaved and um we certainly weren't like that in our twenties. <laughs> it was messy. And yeah, we did like a big theatre project a couple of years ago and the only people that stayed and got pissed were actors over forty five. That was it. Everyone yeah. else went home. Or they had a gym, or they had the self tape. Self tape is a big one, isn't it? Yeah. And turning up for auditions where there's no one but a twelve year old casting assistant <laughs> and you. That can be a bit disheartening sometimes. Especially if they fuck it up for you and you know, read the wrong script. <laughs> do you do you ever get frustrated about the lack of control that you have in, in this profession? Yes. I think you'd have to be a robot not to, wouldn't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I do. But I'm also pretty good at not letting things like that affect me. Um, if I really, really, really want a job and I don't get it, I give myself a day maximum to grieve over it and that's it. So you get that's, that's pretty healthy, you know? I mean, it's yeah. all well and good about trying to leave stuff in the room when yeah. you're auditioning. But to give yourself a set amount of time to go, right, yeah. I'm just going to deal with this shit yeah. and then and by then tomorrow, it's gone. Yeah. then it's yeah. gone. Just the day, that's it. And then it's gone. That is healthy. Yeah. Um, but the, the worst thing is the waiting, isn't it? It's just the waiting. I'm waiting to hear about two things now. It's the waiting. It just takes longer, doesn't it? It How just takes think, longer to go through everyone's... I think because there's more people to sign off now. Yeah, it? yeah. How do you feel about not hearing back at all? Um, I'm... It doesn't bother me as much as it bothers other people, I don't think. I know there's this movement now to hear back. I just... Is that... Yeah, I think... Shows how much I know. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> you know, that you should hear that you haven't got it. But, you know, realistically, you don't know how many people they're seeing. That doesn't really bother me. If it's a real close call and you've had a, you've had a recall and it's been a, a few weeks, then, then, yeah, it's nice to have feedback then. But generally, that's just part of it, isn't it? Yeah. You just don't find out, which is quite annoying, but... Just part and parcel of it, I part suppose. Part of it, yeah, yeah. And when you're not, when things aren't going well, when it's not, when there's no work, how do you deal with that? I Are cook. You, you cook? Yeah, I cook. You're like me, <laughs> Lisa, aren't you? <laughs> I, I never cook when I work. Don't you? It's, no, I just don't feel like it. It's that like my husband loves it when I don't work because he has lovely food. Um, yeah. That's where I put all my creativity when I'm not working, is I cook. And a form of, you know, like a form of form of therapy as well. Yeah, Because yeah. you can, you know, when I cook, I just like nobody else in the no kitchen. No one else. I can't have it, Yeah, you. no, no one else. And I'm very, you know, and I'll tidy up as I go. I'm not a messy cooker. And, you know, sometimes it's fun pretending someone's filming you while you cook. You know, because I'm a bit weird like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've never tried that. I should try, try it. it's really nice. You can speak out loud. Or... Do, do, do you have a little monologue? Do you talk to them, tell them what you're cooking? I usually sing in, put your favourite tunes on, you know, cooking away. It's lovely. And have you ever thought about stopping it all? No. Never, ever? You've never, no. ever been tempted or been close? No, never. Never, ever, ever. You think you will? No. <laughs> I don't think I will. I mean, I'd love to direct more. And I'd love to have the, um, what's the word? Sometimes I can only think of the Welsh word. Say the Welsh word. We'll um, put a translator. <laughs> say it in German. No. Um, not the ability, but the, you know, to, to write the, what's the word? When you, discipline, discipline. I'd love to have the discipline to write more. I do write, but then it goes in a drawer. And then I would like to. Is that do because more you, is that cause you don't finish it? Or? No, I do finish it. It's usually comedy and um, <laughs> it's usually quite dark. And so do you, think it go, do you think it goes in a drawer because you're concerned about someone's reaction to it? Or? I'm not sure why. I'm not sure why. 
but I bought two things I'd written out at the beginning of the year and um, read one that I'd finished a couple of years ago and was quite shocked at how bizarre it was. Needs redoing. Yeah. It kind of hurts my head to write. It's like my head goes in a million different directions. And It's hard work. And do you write alone? No, I've written with people and I've written alone. Um, do you have I a think preference? I, I think I'm probably better on my own. It's hard, though. It's really hard. Lonely. Yeah, yeah. Do you get distracted I'm... loads? <sighs> yeah, the, my big thing is I like, can't get the words out quickly enough and that's really frustrating. You know, like your head goes in all different directions and then yeah. it's like you're trying to get it all out and I do it all by hand and as well because I can't type. You've never gone down the sort of dictaphone route and then <laughs> try <Charlie. to. laughs> um, Well, <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. I, I may try that. That's quite a good, yeah. I was going to say, if you've got all that stuff that, that's you yeah. want to sort of spew out quickly as possible. That's a good idea. Why didn't I think of that? I don't know. You're a good talker, Lisa. You can get it all out and then, all out. then go through it. Yeah, I might try that. I haven't come up with, I, I didn't just come up with that. That's been done. Loads, loads That's been done, babe, is it? <laughs> I give you credit. <laughs> oh, don't give me credit for nothing, Lisa. Um, Lisa, thanks so much for coming in and giving up some of your Sunday. It's been lovely, darling. Thank you for having me. You're very bloody welcome. <laughs> so we're bloody you. <laughs> And there we go. Another episode down. And what a cracker. I, I bloody love Lisa, you know. She's so, she's fearless and she's funny. Uh, and I'm really thrilled that she found the time to come on because we'd been talking about it for a few months. And I know she was busy. And then after the play, she went on holiday. So, Lisa, if you're listening, thank you so much for giving up your time on Sunday and coming to see me and producer Griff. We really appreciate it. Another thing we appreciate is you, dear listener, for downloading and joining us. I'm getting a bit froggy-throated, can you hear me? I better sign off. Thanks so much, though. Go tell your mates to join us, and we will see you next week for episode 35. In the meantime, I've been Craig Parkinson, he's been producer Griff, and this has been... The Two Shot Podcast. I'll see you next week. You take care and stay safe, all right? Cheers. The Two Shot Podcast is presented by me, Craig Parkinson, recorded and produced by Thomas Griffin for Splicing Block. Our music, our brilliant music, is courtesy of Then Thickens. Cheers. <laughs>